Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Carrie. I am an alcoholic. I always have been, and I always will be. My home group is the New Horizons group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Bend, Oregon. And we meet Monday through Thursday in person, where our group is about 30 plus years old. Um, We did switch over to uh, the online platform um, during the pandemic. And we did that for two years. And this was our first week back um, into the church. And so uh, thank you for having me. Uh, First and foremost, it's always an honor and a pleasure to talk anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous, to be invited anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous, but especially to talk about step one. And I think that it's because it comes with such a heavy and important responsibility. I think that step one, um, well, technically it's half of our program. Um, If you're looking at the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, step one is half of our program. Uh, And I'll get into that. But I think it's, um, it, it, it is a responsibility. You know, I'm looking at my big book and it says on the cover, our chief responsibility to the newcomer is an adequate presentation of the program. And so there is a lot of new people in here. Um, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope that you hear something that not only keeps you coming back, but requires you to stay. Um, I'm pausing because I don't want to go off on any, on any tangents. Um, so I did tell you my, I have a home group. I will tell you that I have a sponsor that I use and I have remained teachable. And yes, she has a sponsor who has a sponsor, but it's more important that I have a sponsor and it's more important that I am teachable and that I remain teachable. And she gives me an amazing example of that. Um, she's not a three legacy sponsor. She's a sponsor who knows this big book and lives these spiritual principles better than anybody I've ever met. She does have a home group. She is one among many. She does not think that she has more than one home group. She only does service in one home group. She knows those principles, but I've always had a service sponsor as well because she's never been involved in general service. Um, I'm not ashamed about that today because I wouldn't trade her for anybody. I wouldn't trade her for anything. Um, And then I also sponsor people and um, I sponsor people who sponsor people. And I don't sponsor people who won't sponsor people because those people don't stay sober in my experience. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, I have a sobriety date. It's March 25th, 2010. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, start talking about step one. So I love, I love step one because it's the only one, you know, in the 12 and 12, I think it's in step six. It says that step one is the only one we have to do perfectly, right? It's the only one that we can do perfectly. And I think that having it be two parts and some people say three, you know, some people um, in Alcoholics Anonymous say it's a threefold disease because that's what another fellowship um, has in their literature. The Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous label it a threefold disease. That's fine. I'm not here to argue with you. And if your sponsor says it's threefold, then it's threefold. Um, I'm a big book literalist. <laughs> so um, the reason why I became a big book literalist is because I was a big book anarchist for when I first got here. And as Carrie sees, it just continued to get me drunk. And so when I finally um, got a sponsor who literally does not add anything to this literature and doesn't take anything away from the literature and doesn't change or alter anything, and I recovered from alcoholism, like I'm sold, right? I've drank the Kool-Aid <laughs> and it tastes good. So I'm not gonna, um, I, have to have, I have to have enough humility to not think that I know better than what this literature says. So 
Um, the first step, and we're just going to start super easy here. The first step of Alcoholics Anonymous um, in its short form is uh, on page 59, right? Where the steps are listed. And, and it simply, it, it simply says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. That's half that our lives had become unmanageable. So there's another place in this book that says half measures availed us nothing. That's right above that, right? And so if I get half of the first step, I might get drunk. I believe and I've been taught that that's why our first step is 50% of our program. Now, I've heard things like, oh, alcohol is only mentioned in the first step. Well, maybe if you're reading the steps off the wall, um, but, you know, like Joe and Charlie say, if your only understanding of the steps are off the wall, then you have an off the wall understanding of the steps, right? So I look at the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's alcohol mentioned all throughout, but especially uh, our first step. It's huge. So I have a study edition big book here with me, and in any big book, um, the steps are outlined one through 12 in the first 103 pages, right? So the first 103 pages is, looks like, I'm just going to show you, looks like this. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's the first 103 pages. Now, the the first 44 pages, plus the doctor's opinion, if your sponsor says that's part of the first step, mine does. Let's see if I can do this. Is literally half. I don't know if you can see this. Literally, it's half of the program. So, and this is not with the doctor's opinion included. So, 103 pages is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Bill's story through working with others, which is our 12th step. And uh, and it's pretty thorough. And it used to drive me nuts because they talk about, you know, in the doctor's opinion, which I believe is part of step one, but again, um, that's my opinion. Um, if your sponsor says that it's not part of step one, then then that's fine too. Our literature actually says that the uh, that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is um, the first 164 pages. So the doctor's opinion isn't included in that. So our literature says that that's not part of the program. So that's okay. That's, you know, it's my opinion that when I'm working with others, I make sure to add the doctor's opinion to include that. Um, so when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't know what alcoholism was. I thought it was an addiction. You know, you, you get into this literature and you realize that this literature, nowhere in it talks about addiction. We're not addicted. I'm not addicted to alcohol. I've never been addicted to alcohol. A lot of alcoholics end up addicted to alcohol because it's an addictive drug, right? And late stage alcoholism, you get physically addicted. Um, but the first 44 pages basically drives home that it is not an addiction. Alcoholism is the Alcoholics Anonymous is the only fellowship out of like 200 that deal with addiction that doesn't deal with addiction. And it deals with alcoholism and um, it drives it home. And I used to get annoyed with how much this literature drives home um, what alcoholism is in the first 44 pages. And then it says stuff. I mean, it even makes the literature even makes fun of itself sometimes because it's like they go over what the physical aspect is, right? So alcoholism in this literature is mental and physical, physical and mental, body and mind, mind and body, bodily and mentally. I mean, every time you hear one, you hear the other, right? Um, where, the, where the spiritual aspect comes in is it's a spiritual solution right? There's not much about sickness. There's not much spirituality about sickness. So it's a, it's a sickness of the mind and the body with a spiritual solution and um, a spiritual malady, which is not exempt to the alcoholic. That's why there's over 200 di different 12 step fellowships. I don't even believe, you know, I think that everybody has a spiritual malady and our big book talks about that too. 
it calls it our human problems, right? Um, I think that you don't have to be an alcoholic to have character defects. I think character defects, the anger, the brainstorm, those are the dubious luxury of normal men. But for us, it'll make me drink because I'm an alcoholic. And so I can't, I can't hold on to those dubious luxuries. Um, so uh, what makes me an alcoholic if it's not my spiritual malady? What makes me an alcoholic if there's no such thing as the ism, which I don't believe there is, um, because an ism could be anything, egotism, sexism, alcoholism. Um, I don't know anybody that doesn't have any isms, right? So I don't believe that that's part of the program because it's not in our literature. And, and if it's not in our literature, it's not part of Alcoholics Anonymous. What makes me an alcoholic is because I have alcoholism, um, meaning I have a twofold illness neck up, neck down. So I am, I have a physical allergy to alcohol. What does that mean? It means that once I ingest alcohol in any form at all, which alcohol only comes in liquid form for any loophole finders in the room. <laughs> um, I see Jennifer on here. Uh, I was in a, in a, in a meeting of heroin anonymous. I'm not a heroin addict, but I was just there as an observer respecting their, their traditions. And, uh, and, and this really great big book study, cause they use the big book study as well. This really great big book study, um, of, of heroin anonymous that asks in the beginning, if there's any non heroin addict observers. And so I said, yes, I'm a non heroin addict observer. And to, uh, respect your traditions, I'm not going to say that, um, alcohol is a form of heroin. <laughs> because it's not, I can't, I am not gonna, I'm not gonna find that loophole and try to identify as a heroin addict so I can participate in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not a heroin addict. Um, and, but, but the good news is if you don't identify with alcoholism, but if you're addicted to another substance, there is hope and there is help and Alcoholics Anonymous does not affiliate, but we do cooperate and reach out to me and I will help you. I will walk you into another room holding your hand or zoom you in holding your hand because everybody deserves to find that identification that I have found in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what that, you know, what that identification looks like for me is that I am physically different from other people. When I take alcohol into my system, and this only happens to 90% of us, you know, 90% of the America, I don't like statistics, but if you look at the statistics, some of them say 9%, some of them say 11%, basically 10%, right? Let's, so what happens is I have an allergy. An allergy is described as an abnormal reaction to a food or substance, right? And so I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol that 90% of the rest of the people in the world don't have. So what does that look like? Well, uh, a normal person, and I've, I know because I, I've seen a couple of them in real life. Most of the time I see them on TV, but I've seen a couple of them. I've witnessed this. They think they've had a hard day at work, right? And so they, they come home from work and they're like, oh my gosh, I have had a stressful day. I need a drink. And because, I mean, here's a little secret that you won't hear very often in AA. Normal people like the effects produced by alcohol too. <laughs> That's why the book says people like the effects produced by alcohol, not alcoholics. Um, and, and that's why, you know, you go to a restaurant and a soda is $2 and a beer is $7. It's like, it's got a little something in it, right? It's not just for alcoholics. Normal people like the effects produced by alcohol too. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's relaxing. It means conviviality and joyousness, right? Um, that's what our big book says for normal people. It's a great thing. Um, so they come home from work and they've been stressed out because they've had a hard day. And so they go to the fridge and they crack open a beer or they pour themselves a drink or whatever, you know, whatever they need to do. And they have a, a drink and they experience that sense of ease and comfort that comes at once. And then they eat dinner and then they might play cards or read a story to the kids and then brush their teeth, maybe watch a little TV. Then they go to bed and get up and go to work the next morning. I've seen these people. They exist. Now for me, I think I've had a hard day <laughs> and I need a drink and I crack open that beer 
or pour myself a drink and it is on and there's no off switch. That is an abnormal reaction to alcohol. I don't know when King Alcohol is going to let me have a night where I'm home on time. I don't know if King Alcohol is going to make me wake up in Mexico. I don't know what King Alcohol is going to do to me because I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. My body is different than other people. I am bodily and mentally different from my fellows. So, so that's one aspect, right? Now, the other aspect is the mental. I'm bodily and mentally different, right? So what does that mean? Neck up. So the physical craving, and when you hear the word craving, that in our book, in our literature, except for Dr. Bob, but he's in the back of the book. He's not in the, but Dr. Bob didn't understand a whole lot about alcoholism. I love Dr. Silkworth and Bill Wilson. Um, to me, those are the founders. Um, we wouldn't have this program if it weren't for Silkworth. Uh, but um, according to Silkworth and Bill and our first 164 pages, the physical factor is the craving, right? And so you'll hear a newcomer come in and maybe they have 90 days and they say, oh my gosh, I was craving a drink today. No, you weren't. That's the, that's the mental obsession, right? The physical craving only happens after I take the first drink. It can't happen if I, it's, a, it's the allergy, right? And so if I don't take the first drink, I don't experience that physical craving. So what am I experiencing if I think I'm craving a drink? I, I'm experiencing that mental obsession. Um, and the book talks about that too. It's the mental obsession that precedes the first drink. The subtle insanity that precedes the first drink is what Silkworth, um, is how Silkworth words that. And so- if I was just allergic, right, then it would be a one-step program. If it was a one-fold disease, I would just simply not drink, um, like a peanut allergy, right? I would not go and think, oh my gosh, maybe if I have just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, maybe just one, I don't obsess about it, Um if I had a strawberry allergy, I just know that I have an abnormal reaction to strawberries. Therefore, I have to avoid them. I don't go down to the local ice cream shop and look at other people eating ice cream and think, ooh, maybe if I just have a shake with, with artificial flavoring of strawberry. No, no, I just don't eat strawberries. And so if I was just allergic to alcohol, I could easily just have it be a one fold disease. And, and, and I would have a one step program. It would be, I admit I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable when I drink. And so I'm done drinking. And I never pick up again, but I have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. And for me, it sounds a little bit like a college party up in my head going drink, 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 drink 24 seven. Like when I first came to you guys, um, I had it, I had that obsession bad. Like I couldn't even go down the cheese aisle in the grocery store because it shares the aisle with the beer, right? And I'm a beer drinker. And so I couldn't even go down that aisle because I had no mental defense against that first drink. Like, even though I was allergic, even though I don't want to drink, I end up drunk after swearing it off forever. And that's the difference for me between alcoholic insanity and denial. Now, the book doesn't use the word denial. I know a lot of the membership does, um, but I'll, I'll give you an example of the difference between denial and alcoholic insanity. Denial is when I walk into the kitchen and my four-year-old has her hand behind her back, a cheek full of chocolate, the cookie jar is open and she says, nothing, nothing. Okay, you, you know dang well that you just ate a bunch of cookies before dinner and you just got caught and you're denying it, right? Like alcoholic insanity is like what Bill Wilson had. Like you can hook me up to a lie detector test and I will pass saying I am never going to drink again. And I woke up in alcoholic insanity so many mornings covered in my own vomit, um, you know, wondering where I was the night before, who I was with, who, what I did, who I did it with, like all of these things. And I would be in complete earnestness saying, I am never, I am never going to drink again. 
and I'm not in denial. I, you could hook me up to a lie detector test and I will pass. I meant it with every fiber of my being. And then I'm drunk again. I have no mental defense against that first drink. So it's not, unfortunately, like a strawberry allergy. And that's where steps two through 12 come in, right? Um, is because we have a solution to um, recover from that mental obsession, from alcoholism. Um, so, you know, I used to think that I would hear people in meetings describing uh, the alcoholic insanity, like if they had a bad day and maybe they they, maybe they had some road rage and, and I've heard shared in meetings. Oh my gosh, my alcoholic mind. Oh, it was terrible today. I had the worst road rage. I had alcoholic insanity, but I've never had road rage. I might be the only one in the world, <laughs> but I couldn't identify with that. My best friend who is not an alcoholic, she has some of the worst road rage I've ever seen. And she's not an alcoholic, right? And so, I mean, I'm the type of driver who is like, oh no, go ahead, you go ahead, you know, go, I'm not in any hurry. <laughs> like, I love driving, I love in my car, it's always really warm, you know, and I, I'm not, I don't have road rage, no matter how much alcoholic insanity I have, I don't have road rage, right? That's not alcoholic insanity. Um, road rage is a, is a symptom of a human characteristic. Um, so I didn't understand the word insanity for a long time, um, because I thought it meant chewing on my sleeve or being thrown into the insane asylum or having to, you know, wear a straight jacket or padded room or drooling, or, you know, I've seen 12 monkeys. I know what insanity looks like. Right. And, and I didn't experience any of that stuff. And so luckily I had a sponsor who knows this book right and knows what alcoholic insanity looks like because of the because of what it says in the book and um so she took me to this place that says um in the doctor's opinion so it says there are some there are types entirely normal in every respect except in the effect alcohol has upon them they are often intelligent able friendly people um, and then in Bill's story, Bill, he couldn't figure it out either. And he, he says he had been seriously ill. This is on page seven, bodily and mentally. And then he says, it relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. Well, when I came in, my life was not in shambles. Like I had never paid a bill late a day in my life. Um, I didn't need to go to detox. Um, I wasn't physically addicted to alcohol yet. Um, I didn't see my alcoholism. All I knew is that I couldn't stay away from alcohol. And that once I started drinking, I didn't know how to stop or when I was going to stop. I didn't know that those are the two things, the only two things that make me alcoholic, that qualify me as an alcoholic. So then on page 21, it talks about, again, it just drives home over and over again. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. Now, notice how this isn't talking about people, places, and things. It's not talking about drugs, alcohol, sex, and gambling. It's talking about liquor. And thank God, you know, because when I came in, um, I didn't get to a meeting that focused on the literature right away. Um, I got a, to a meeting where it was fun. Like I was, you know, I was used to the bar scene, right? I was a bar drinker. So the meetings that I felt comfortable in are where everybody's sleeping with everybody. There's chairs being thrown. You know, they were talking about anything and everything under the sun, except for alcoholism and recovery from. <clears throat> they were talking about 
smoking, shooting, poking, probing, snorting, you know, everything except for drinking. Um, and, and I didn't understand that none of that stuff has anything to do with alcoholism. Addiction is completely separate. It, 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 he is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. Um, and then on page 26, as if it's not driving it home well enough, um, he seems quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet had no control whatsoever over alcohol. Uh, you know, but then page 38, I mean, it just keeps on. I could go on probably all day with this stuff, but um it says, however intelligent we may have been in other respects where alcohol has been involved, we've been strangely insane. Um, and, and, you know, and then the next page is when it says, this is a point we wish to emphasize and reemphasize to smash home upon the alcoholic readers as it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience. Let's take another illustration. And then they talk about Fred because this is already after the jaywalker and, you know, Jim with the, uh, with the whiskey and the milk. And so they're really wanting to get both of these physical and mental aspects uh, smashed home to the reader. Why? Why is that? Why can't I just admit that I have a problem with alcohol and get on with the rest of the steps? Well, here's my experience with that. I've sponsored a lot of women, a lot of women. And the ones that I have seen that don't, that don't make it, um, I'll just talk about one in particular. I was, one, one woman I was working with, she, she completely understood the physical allergy, like completely understood. She knew that when she takes a drink, it's like handing her keys to the, of her car to somebody else saying, it's take me wherever you want to go. Cause I'm no longer in charge. Right. She knew that she had an abnormal reaction to alcohol, but she didn't buy into the whole, you know, insanity. I don't know. I mean, I have some pretty good willpower. I just need to never drink again. Right. So she went through the steps. I don't know about wholeheartedly. I definitely don't, wouldn't call it with the desperation of a, of a drowning man, because she thought now that she knows she's allergic, she will never drink again. Right. And one day she just turned up drunk. She couldn't, under, she couldn't understand. She says, but I know, I knew this. I, you know, I played the drink through you did what? Like, let's look at what the book says about that playing the tape through you know, um, I, I don't, I don't know it, it for my big book on page 24 says that the fact is that most alcoholics for reasons yet obscure have lost the power of choice in drink. You can't just choose not to drink. If I could choose not to drink, I wouldn't need AA. If I could just put the plug in the jug, why would I need you guys? Like, why would I need to come to AA if that was a choice for me? Our so-called, and I love the way Bill writes, our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into the consciousness with sufficient force the memory and the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. No human power. The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts do occur, if I do try to remember my last drink, right? Cause I've heard that too. Um, if you don't remember your last drink, you haven't had, you haven't had it. Well, I'm sorry. I don't remember my last drink. I'm a blackout drinker. There's no way in heck I'm going to remember my last drink. Um, if these thoughts do occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea. Here's the insanity that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure, not just a failure. Bill put the word complete in there. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot, hot stove. Yeah, the alcoholic might say to himself in the most casual way, oh, it won't burn me this time. So here's how, or perhaps he doesn't think at all. You know, so that's where... That's where if I only understand that I have a physical allergy and I don't, and I don't, I, I don't believe that I am also mentally different 
and I need to have a spiritual awakening or I'm going to end up drunk, then I'm going to end up drunk. And so let's look at the other, the flip side of the coin, right? So what about this woman that I was working with who knew that she had, she knew she had a spiritual malady. She knew that she could not keep away from the drink. She had drinking dreams nightly, you know, um, uh, she knew that she had sworn it off forever and cannot stay away from drinking. She had basically locked herself. She didn't go out. She didn't go to the grocery store. She didn't because she knew that she had a mental obsession, right? But I don't think she believed wholeheartedly in the physical allergy because she went into those steps with me with the desperation of a drowning woman. And this woman who could think nothing other than about the drink 24 seven. And that was my case too. You know, if I was, I was rarely mildly intoxicated. I was always more or less insanely drunk, like the book talks about. And for me, like it was 24 seven, just like this woman that I, that I sponsored, it was 24 seven. It was like, if I am not drinking, and insanely intoxicated, then I'm recovering from a terrible hangover. And if I'm not drinking or recovering from a terrible hangover, I'm planning the next drink. So 24 seven, I'm occupied, right? With, with drinking that, that college party, drink, drink, drink. Well, this woman, she knew that she had that. And so she went through the steps and she actually had a spiritual awakening, right? And that obsession was relieved. And we were talking about it. And, and when we got to the 10th step promises where it says, you know, the problem had been removed, it does not exist for us. She said, oh my God, this has happened for me. I haven't even thought about drinking in months. And I said, isn't this amazing? This is the miracle of it, right? And we're celebrating this. And shortly after, she decided to drink because she said, well, now that I'm relieved of the obsession, now that I'm recovered, I could probably have just one. I'm not, I'm not obsessing about it anymore. She didn't understand that she is physically different than other people. And so that's why this book, there's two folds, you know, you got to have both. I am, I, I am powerless over alcohol. Once I ingest alcohol, all bets are off. I'm powerless. And, and, and my life has become unmanageable because I have this, this thing in my head that thinks about nothing other than drinking. And so if I don't have both pieces of the puzzle, that's half measures and I end up drunk. And that's why this book does such an amazing job. And Silkworth does such an amazing job talking about the body and the mind, the mind and the body, physical and mental, mental and physical, over and over and over again until you almost get so sick of hearing about it, right? In these first 44 pages. And then at the end of the first 44 pages, um, well, the end of the first 43 pages, on page 44, where the book stops talking about the alcoholic condition and starts talking about the solution right? The spiritual remedy. Um, the first paragraph though says in the preceding chapters, <laughs> you've learned something about alcoholism. <laughs> we hope that we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. I mean, and they do, they really drive it home. Um, if when you honestly want to, you cannot find, you cannot quit entirely, right? mentally, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, physical craving, you are probably alcoholic. And that solidifies the first step. That's the last, that's the last sentence in the book about the first step before we move on to, you know, steps two through 11, which are the solution, which is the solution. Um, but they take a lot of time in the big book to talk about um, what an alcoholic is. And, and, and that's all first step stuff, right? So I'm going to go to the bottom of page 20, because I'm a real alcoholic. I used to hate it when people use that term. But that term saved my life. I used to hate it when people use that term before I understood what a real alcoholic was. Um, 
the term real alcoholic is all over the big book, A, but where it's really important for me is it, on the bottom of page 20, it talks about the hard drinker. Now, the hard drinker is what all AA literature, not just the big book, all AA literature refers to when they're talking about the non-alcoholic. So let's, let's listen to what the non-alcoholic hard drinker sounds like. When we have this certain type of hard drinker, he may have the habit badly enough, and we understand that drink that alcoholism is not a habit, right? It's you can't drink your way into alcoholism. You can use your way into any addiction, but only one out of every ten people have alcoholism, um, and so it's not a habit. So it says we have this certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit gradually and badly enough to gradually impair him mentally and physically. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If a sufficient strong enough reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can stop or moderate. He may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. So it's saying this person who's just physically addicted to alcohol because they've drank so much and for so long and so often, they might even need to go to detox. But what about the real alcoholic? That's how the next that's how the next paragraph starts out. He may start off a moderate drinker. He may or may not may not become a continuous hard drinker. Not a qualification. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. That's the physical factor. That's the alcoholic. That's what qualifies me to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous right there. And so if you're in the room today thinking that you're not addicted to alcohol, that you've never had to go through detox, so you can't be an alcoholic, I, I hope that this, this part in the book offers you some hope. Um, because I've never been physically addicted to alcohol. I never had to go through detox. What makes me an alcoholic is once I start drinking, I have no control over the amount I take. And once I stop, because I run out, blackout, or pass out, <laughs> I can't stay stopped. Um, I have a neighbor, you know, when I was new, when I was newly recovered, because I, I didn't know that there was, I thought, that Alcoholics Anonymous was going to teach me how to not drink one day at a time, right? How to white knuckle it from one meeting to the next for the rest of my miserable life. <laughs> and, you know, if, if AA did give me that, I would actually probably be a satisfied customer. I would be miserable, but at least I wouldn't be waking up in places that I didn't belong doing things that I didn't, shouldn't be doing, right? Um, I wouldn't have the DUIs. I wouldn't have. So I'm not saying that uh, people who use AA meetings as kind of, you know, group therapy and keeping away from the drink one day at a time, if that works for you, that's awesome. That's what I thought AA was when I came here. I had no idea that the physical, that the freedom from alcohol was not just physically not picking up a drink, but it's freedom from alcohol up here, right? I had no idea that I could not only not drink one day at a time, white knuckling it, but that I could not want to drink, that I could, that I could be free of that obsession, which is what this, this program promises me. Like 24 seven, I got alcohol up here. When I came to you, I went through these 12 steps and I haven't even had a drinking dream since I was 18 months sober. I mean, not even my subconscious thinks about alcohol. <laughs> I can go wherever I want to. I'm a free woman. Anywhere that other, that other people can go, I can go too. Um, you know, alcohol to me today is like battery acid. Why would I pick up something that I know it, it would kill me? Like sanity has returned, you know? And, and that's what AA has actually that's that's what I have gotten from this amazing, amazing program is freedom, freedom from alcohol. So I had no idea that this type of 
freedom was here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.